Hello everyone, welcome again to the next Red Quills tutorial on how to make a map. This time we're doing a Styles of Fantasy Map and How to Show Culture on a Fantasy Map. So I'm going to be using the Boiling Isles from the Disney series, which is uh, the Owl House. Now if you haven't seen it, it's a kids animated series, which deals with uh, magic and murder and genocide and all the, all the great things that uh, animated series tend to go into when they're really, really good. Uh, I'm actually going to do this in five different styles, and in order to make the map, I've had to use a few reference pictures and a thread on uh, Reddit from BearBro1234. Um, my absolute thanks to him for doing a lot of the heavy lifting on this map. I've used a lot of his names and his positions for various locations, and I'm just going to add in a few more to make it a bit more of a detailed map, and I'm going to go with a later incarnation of the Boiling Isles with the raised hand. Now if you want this map by the way you can find it on my website at the uh, www.red-quills.com slash blog. I'll put the link in the bottom below but if you wanted to get the map you can download it there at the A2 file size. So I'm going to start here I'm going to talk about culture and I'm going to have five different boxes each with a different fantasy map style so you can use those styles while we're talking about how to make fantasy culture. So the first one I'm going to start off with is the far left, which is the top of the skull, and I'm going to do it in a topographical style, uh, which is a really simple way of doing it. You're, all you need is three sizes of fine liner black pen. I would recommend getting different sizes of fine liner pen because you're going to look a bit wonky without it. I'm using a 0.7 millimeter here, uh, a 0 0.4. I'm using a, a 0.7 millimeter here, a 0.4 millimeter, a 0.1 millimeter, and a 0.05 millimeter black fine liner to make this, as well as a red fine liner to do the, the labeling. Honestly, it's a really simple way of doing it, but you do have to think your way through it. If you start without thinking your way through it, you're going to make a bit of a mess with it later on. So topographical maps use lines to show the incline and height of various parts of the landscape. It doesn't have as much... Um, foresting or, or rivers it's it's not really a picturesque map but it is striking it is evocative which is why I wanted to use it on the skull here I've just finished that it took the least amount of time thank goodness because the topographical style is a really complicated style and I only did it on a bit of the skull so I'm gonna move on to the torso now I'm gonna do that in the high fantasy styles that you used to get in the old books of the 20s to the 60s. Lord of the Rings, when it first came out, was in a similar style to this. You know, uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe had maps in this style. I quite like it. Uh, it has its drawbacks, but it's easy to print and it's easy to make. So I'm going to go through with a thick black fine liner here, 0.7 millimeter again, and I'm going to label in my red fine liner to follow that up with. Uh, always label before you do anything else, otherwise your words are going to be really cramped. Start with coastlines and then mountains, then label, and then you can do rivers, cities, um, you know, roads, forests. Now the thing that sets these maps apart from other maps is that, uh, that style of forest and river and the lack of colors. So you're only going to use two colors for this, you're going to use red and black. In the books they would only ever use one color, but I think that's visually boring, and on a big map like this I'm going to use two just to just to make it pop a little bit. So I'm going to use red and black, but I'm going to use red much, much less, just as a, an, an homage to that style. Now you're going to go with simple shapes and simple lines. So after going with the thick black fine liner, all of your other natural uh, landmarks are going to be done in a thinner 0.4 fine liner. So all of your, in this case, ribs uh, are going to be done in that style. When you do your trees, they're going to be hollow ovals, about two or three millimeters tall, with a small dot for the trunk at the bottom. You can group them together so they're clumps. Uh, you can see it later on when I do the, the pan over. I'd like to take this opportunity, and we'll talk about the first thing I want to talk about when you're doing a fantasy map, which is uh, history. So when you're making a fantasy world, I recommend you start with a map, and then after that you need to figure out what your history is going to be. In a map like this, this is a great place to talk about it, because you can see very clearly right from the off that the history of this place is that this was once a titan. 
he was alive. He moved around and then he died. And then all sorts of creatures came to swarm on the decaying corpse of that once great beast. And that has a lot of implications there. But that timeline of your history, you know, will start with the creation of your world and then move to the primordial times, then into pre-civilization and then finally to civilization. If you've got a world that has things like schools, that has things like kings or queens or courts, or if you have things like a postal service or a navy or roads, you're going to have to ask questions about what the world was like before those things and why they came to be. The more detail you have about the history of your world, the easier it will be to explore that world. If you're finding it difficult to start writing, to put pen to paper, it's because you don't know enough about the surroundings of your story. If you know everything there is to know about your characters and the world that they're in, then it will be as easy as breathing. If you're struggling, you need more detail. If you hit writer's block, it's a great exercise to sit down and do a timeline. So I would say, figure out your history. Alright, so we're going to move on to the third panel here. I'm going to come back later and do the coastlines on the, the Titan in the second one. But actually, before I do, do that, I'm going to do some shading on the hands. I'm going to shade the hands in a gray. Uh, it is also a fine liner, but seeing as it's a large uh, area here, it doesn't really matter what size that is. Technically, you got me. The original books of the 20s to the 60s probably would not have had a third color shading. You got me there. They would have used um, thatching or dotting, but in black. I didn't want to overcomplicate the look of the map. I wanted to kind of be a little bit, you know, uniform so that it's not as difficult for a person to look at from a distance. So I, I just used a gray shader here because I'll be using it on later maps. But that's something for you to be aware of if you're going for that style. Uh, thatching with a thinner fine liner is probably the way to go. Or dot shading. Or flat shading. But always with black. All right, we're going to go to the third panel now, uh, which is going to be the two colors. This is the modern fantasy style. You can see I'm, I'm changing up the style of the ribs there. But the difference between the old and the new styles is that the new styles have better printers. So they can print things smaller, but more importantly, in color. So the two color style has icons, nature, rivers and roads and things like that, all in red in this case. It can be whatever color you want, but it'll be black and another color. Generally it won't be like a yellow that's too light. Something that's got a bit more oomph to it, it's a bit more vibrant. So purples, blues, reds, greens, oranges, those will be the colors that you want to use. So I'm doing my icons in red, I'm doing my labels in black, I'm doing my coastlines in black, and then of course everything else will be in red. The trees I've done in, uh, so the there's just simple ovals uh, in red with a black dot for the trunk. And I think that's a really satisfying look. They're all quite small. Um, they're only about two or three millimeters tall. You'll see I'll, I'm going to do them in a minute. And I'm also going to do marshlands as well. Red reeds with black flowers. So this is a great chance to talk about the next part of making the culture of your fantasy world, which is the language and the arts. You know, when you're starting the history of your world, you're going to have to ask yourself what happened at the beginning, what was the creation like, what was the primordial times like, and when the sentient races came about, if you've got more than one, you know, what did that look like? Did they all start at the same place or were there different points of awakening? Um, because that's going to inform your languages. You know, when you think about it, if everyone starts in the same place, they would have all spoken the same language at some point in history, which means that there is some unified ancestor of every word in every language spoken on the world. You know, we have our own mythological parallels to that. The idea of the Tower of Babel, for instance, is a very interesting one that I've used a couple of times. You know, if you've got language, you've got arts. And I talked about arts last week. Uh, you know, what, what it's like to have songs and stories. But it's, it's important to think about. It's worth saying again. You know, when you're writing your history, 
what stories do people tell about their history? You know, art is a huge part of culture. I'm going to do the fourth panel now, which is the, the legs, and it's in the red quill style. So the previous style had two colors. The style before that also had two colors. This style has about 12. I think a bit more than that. So the forests themselves use six different colors. And I've got two different kinds of forest here. And it's a red colored forest on the lowlands because that, that matches the other kind of trees that we've already done. And also because on the Boiling Isles in the TV series, all of the trees are red. And then in the higher areas on the knees, um, we're going with more of a snow-capped kind of vibe. And I'm just going to do the trees in blues and purples to, to signify that, that change. And I think it'll be quite striking. So as always, you start with a thick black fine liner. You move into using a red fine liner to do the, to do the cities. Uh, the next thing that I do is I use the, the smaller black to signify typically mountain ranges and, and hills and, and things like that. But in this case, it's I'm just trying to give a little bit more contouring to a really three-dimensional map, much more three-dimensional than you normally get. Then I'm going to do... I'm going to make sure that I've got the labeling done. Uh, I'm going to do that in the red. There's going to be a lot of red in this map. Normally I use red because it stands out quite well against the green that dominates the rest of the map because I do a lot of landscape icons. But it just won't stand out that much this time, and that's all right. I'm going to use an orange to do the roads. I'm going to go in after that, and I'm going to use red, magenta, pink, and purple for the forests. And a very similar kind of style to the, to the previous two color one, which is just a, a simple oval or a simple triangle, whether it's, you know, a, um, an oak or a pine, for instance. That, that's, it's just a general different shape of tree. And you can use different color gradients to show different altitudes or different kinds of forests. So for instance, in other maps, if you've got a, a forest of you know, pines, you can go for darker greens mixed with browns. If you've got a forest of oaks, you can go with lighter greens. If you've got a, you know, peach blossoms, you can do it in pinks and purples. The point is that you've got at least three different colors of tree, and then your trunks are just a dot at the bottom in a fine line, a very, ideally a very thin one, 0.4 or less, uh, and you can have that in a darker color so that it's easy to see from a distance. Because these are going to be quite small. You're only going to go for two or three millimeters tall. All right, and while I'm doing that, we can talk about the next part, which is um, magic. When you're ma making a culture for a fantasy world, you want to talk about magic. And in this case, again, it's really easy for the Boiling Isles. It is on the decaying body of an ancient titan. Magic literally pumped through his veins once upon a time, and everyone on the surface of the isle knows how to use some kind of magic, generally speaking. But how does that impact your world? You know, what does that look like for you? Is magic everywhere, like it is in this setting? Or is magic something that only a few have access to? Because either way, the existence of magic, the ability to solve your problems through study or emotion rather than just through plain old hard work or conquest that's going to change history in a big big way so when you're deciding the, the big points the big changes the big battles or, or moments in history that have made your world the way it is understanding what the history of magic is and what its effect is on a on a on the general population on an individual is going to be really important for you All right, I'm going to use a bit of shading on this map as well. When I get to it, I'll, I'll use that gray pen again. It's going to provide a more uniform kind of color. It's why I'm working with red in the water, because it matches the... It'll, it'll have some uniformity through the whole map, uh, despite the fact that the water isn't actually red in the Boiling Isles. Please don't come into the comments and tell me that. I, I do know that. 
I have watched the series. It's quite good. I'd recommend it. So you can see I'm coming in here with all the different colors that I mentioned earlier. I've done some more detailing than on the other maps. You can see the ferry routes that I've done. There's more roads. There's more contouring. Um, I'm going through and doing different, different kinds of landscaping. So there's not just trees. There's not just marshes. I've got farmlands in there as well. I've got different kinds of forest. problem with my style is the red quill style is that it takes a really long time to do obviously because you're having to switch between the different colors the different styles different shapes uh, so it slows you down you know the other you can see how quickly I did that second panel which despite the fact that it's by far the most populated of all of these panels has the most in it it took me less time than this does because of the detail that has to go into coloring this, making it look good. All right, we're going to go into the last panel now, uh, which is the illustrated panel. And for this one, uh, I'm actually going to use pencils as well. I know, controversial choice. But um, so again, I always start with a thick fine liner. Um, for in this case, I use it because that. That denotes some kind of uniformity. It allows the eye to track what's happening a lot more easily. Then I come in with a thinner fine line of pen. This is the point 0.4. And then uh, that one I'm holding there is the point 0.1. And I'm going to give some shapes. Uh, in this case, it's the shapes of cliffs, forests, and meadows. Uh, so the, the shins of the giants, as you can see, are at an angle. The feet are in the water. The knees are up. So that makes the, the area quite treacherous. So it has a lot of uh, cliffs as opposed to a lot of you know, rolling open plains. So I'm just going to mark out those areas. I'm going to label it now. You can see I'm doing that. I've done little uh, drawings for the towns. Again, it's on quite a small scale. So it's, um, I use a 0.1 and a 0.05 fine liner for those. Uh, and then do the red labeling. And then you can come in. You can do a smaller style for it. Uh, just before I do the pencils, I am going to go through and do this ocean. So in this case, in the two color map, that red that I'm using on the the grid on the ocean is the same color as the trees and the rivers and the icons. In my map, it's a slightly different red. Um, it's a darker red, it's more magenta. And of course, in the illustrated one, in order to make the illustrations on the shins stand out more, I'm going to use a black. That's just going to be a 0.4 black fine liner. And while we're doing this, this is a great time to talk about the last two points in figuring out the history of your world, which are religion and nature. So religion is an important one to talk about because that's going to help you to figure out what's the unifying point of your history. Religion has always been a unifier and a point of contention. I, I hope no one takes offense to that. I think it's quite obvious. But when you're writing a religion for your world, you can use that as a starting point for figuring out so many different things. When your characters encounter an obstacle, if they pray, you know, who are they praying to? What does that look like? All the standard questions about religion, but more importantly, how common is that? You know, do you have temples and why? You know, do you have to pray at certain times of the day? Do you have rituals? Do you have festivals? Do you have feast days or holy days or saints? Do you have the idea of direct influence of 
the, the gods, you know, demigods and heroes, avatars and angels. What does that look like? How does that affect your history? How does that affect your culture? Do you have a king who is also a god? Do you have an emperor who is also an immortal warrior? You know, which moves us on to the last point, you know, which is nature, you know, your surroundings. When you've got a culture, you're going to be influenced by what is around you. In this case, it's going to be very influential that everyone lives in the decaying body of a primordial being. That's huge. That's important. But what about animals and trees and plants? When you've got feast days, you know, in, in, in our human calendars, a lot of the time, particularly in the Western world, that aligns with the solar calendar. In the east, a lot of the time, it's the lunar calendar. Not always, both ways. But those relationships with nature are important. Midwinter and midsummer, or, or you know, the spring and autumn equinoxes, they are significant for us because of our connections with nature. All right, I'm just about finished up here. I'm gonna do some last thatching some last texturing with that very thin fine liner and then I think we're ready to see it all right thanks for everyone for watching I hope you enjoyed this video I hope it was uh, helpful to you if you've got any questions please comment them below if you've got a request for the next map uh, also you know if you want to shoot me a comment I will use it to teach some kind of lesson um, if you want your own map for your own reasons uh, you can always ask for one. You can go onto my website. You can commission me to draw one. Have a good one, everyone.